can it really be seven days since we last spoke to Van Connor? Well, I bumped into him in the week because he was over there on Talk TV doing a grand job reviewing the papers, and he's with us now with his one, two, three days of Telebox three view film recommendations. I see his three of matches with three of my own. You get half a dozen movies to think about over the weekend. Good morning, Van, and how's your week been? And what did you make of Ghostbusters Frozen Empire? I had a really great... Do you know what? I, I, I'm I sure yeah, producer Stewart has extolled the virtues of Ghostbusters Frozen Empire to you ad nauseum by now. Uh, do you know what? I'm going to heap on top of that and just say I really enjoyed it. I know he did. I had a great time as well. I was sat next to him during the screening and we had a rollicking time. Well, a number of papers have been very sniffy about it. Most people said, though, it's entertaining but not that funny. Did you laugh at any point? I, I laughed immensely. It's an hour 55. I must have spent an hour 20 just laughing myself senseless. I think in the case of Stuart, maybe an hour 40. Okay. An hour 40. <laughs> He's easy. easily amused yeah. though, isn't he? He laughs when he sees himself he in the is. mirror. He like is. So would we. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sitting tomorrow, or this afternoon, in fact, I've got tickets to go and sit, so I'm looking forward to that. But now I'm looking forward to your first recommendation for Friday's film. What have you gone for, Van? Oh, I've gone for something very different to Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Uh, not, not quite as funny. I've gone for the Blumhouse feature film adaptation of Fantasy Island. This one kind of uh, slipped through the cracks in early 2020. This came out during the COVID shuffle. You know, that period when we were going into lockdowns and cinema started shutting down. Uh, Fantasy Island came out around that time and it, I think it was one of the last films to open when we went into lockdown. Went on to digital very quickly stars Michael Peña as Mr. Rourke you know you remember him as as uh, Mick, uh, as, as Mikhail Rantaban and uh, he's now playing Michael Peña he is the, the the steward of the fantasy island in which rich people come along to live their fantasies however in the case of Blumhouse being the horror label that they are these are not actual fantasies they are more nightmares and we have a, a group of, of you know, guests, including Maggie Q. I believe you have Victoria Hale on there as well. A bunch of like CW level stars who soon find their greatest fantasies unleashed upon them in nightmare form. You can see this on film four tonight at 1050. I, no one saw this when it came out because, as I say, of the COVID shuffle, but I think it's really, really good. Um, came out so 2020, as I say, directed by Jeff Wadlow, who'd done the kick out sequel. And I think some serious horror trust. I've got a clip for you. You must remember the original Ricardo Montalban. I do. Uh, Fantasy Island in the 70s. Yeah, you know, the plane boss, the plane. Because there was Love Boat and there was Fantasy Island and some people would confuse them when you get Fantasy Boat and Love Island. Not the same thing at all. Love Island in terms of an ITV2. But no, Fantasy Island was a great idea. A bit like a precursor to, but a benign precursor to Westworld. That kind of notion. Very much so. And I think having it in the hands of someone like Blumhouse, you know, who are kind of the go to micro budget horror label, perfect marriage of like material and producers, absolutely just gangbusters. Watch the movie. You will love uh, it's on, I say, tonight, film four, 10 to 11, 10 50. I've got a clip for you. This is uh, Michael Pena introducing the concept to the guests, the rich, elusive guests who have been drawn to the fantasy island. Here we go. Good evening. I am Mr. Rourke, the ambassador to your deepest desires. Let me officially welcome you to Fantasy Island. We were all just discussing how this works exactly. Ah, uh, you will know soon enough, and I promise you will not be disappointed. The island has two rules. There is only one fantasy per guest. And two, you must see your fantasy through to its natural conclusion, no matter what. Well, why wouldn't we? Because fantasies rarely play out as you or I might expect, but they always play out exactly as they should. Not even you know how they're going to go? Only the island knows. I am, but it's humble story. I'm lucky the sound of that one. I did not catch it when it came out the first time around, so I'm looking forward to that. No, I've, gone for, I've gone for Money in the Bank on my first recommendation because this is, without a doubt, for me, one of the funniest films of the yeah. century. Although it's set in a rather different era. It's set in the 1970s when crimpling was the thing, and men would talk about scratch, 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 and be quite happy to squeeze one's buttocks in the street. But only if you were a Roger Melly type figure called Ron Burgundy, the anchor man. And Ron, the legend of Ron Burgundy, anchor man, is on uh, Channel 4 tonight, five minutes past 11, in the shell of an to spoof all those incredibly macho, chin to camera, Kent Brockman type from The Simpsons uh, newsreaders. America mm. still produces them. And, of course, he's also a dimwit, which makes it even funny. He's played by Will Ferrell with absolutely no self-awareness. He delights in a clone called Panther Sweat. And when he's trying to impress a female newsreader, 
does, he thinks the whole idea is ridiculous. He starts admiring his own upper arms and calling them his guns. So, you know, we've all come across people like that, fish out of the water. With, at any time, though, he was king of San Diego, and I think his... He had a, he had a sign, a catch, a, a sign of phrase near the end of his news bulletins. Something like, stay classy San Diego or something, which of course he then decides the other one was trying to steal. Very funny film. They, he's one of those people who can only read the Ulster Cue, can't do anything to save his life. Jack Black came in, and it's <laughs> Steve Car- Carroll based his, I mean, I think this launched Steve Carroll as a star in his own right, this film, because it's an absolute belter. And it is of course one of those films that I think it cost 20 odd million, made 90 million. I've never seen the, the sequel. Which I, when really he starts a cable channel. Have you seen uh, Anchorman 2, uh, Van? I have, and it's not anywhere near no. as good as no. the first one. It's worth noting as well, the first movie, there was so much improv on the first movie, because I bought the first movie on US import, and if you paid, I think it was two quid extra, you could get the deluxe pack where you got, you got Anchorman as a film, and you got a second entire film that was made out of the oh, deleted wow. scenes and they had they'd stitch it into a narrative so it can't you can't anchor anchorman sequel about 15 years before they actually did an anchorman sequel and it was absolutely but 60 percent of the time it works every time Got to get hold of a copy of that. It was uh, directed by and co-written by Adam McKay, who, like uh, Will Ferrell, came up through Saturday Night Live. Of course, he worked with Will Ferrell then on Step Brothers, The Other Guys, and Talladega Nights, all of which have got their admirers, but they're not as good as the film on at five minutes past 11. Tonight, on Channel 4, you've got to love the anchor man. <clears throat> I'm ready. Good evening, I'm Ron Burgundy. Here's what's going on in your world tonight. It was the 1970s. Looking good, San Diego. In a simpler time. Hey, Garth, how's the divorce? Oh, not so good. I'll probably never see my kids. Fantastic. It took a simpler man. Follow leads, confirm sources, real journalism, my friend. Great. Right on. Now, what's a lead? (laughs) To deliver the news. I have some very urgent and important breaking news. Cannonball! Cannonball! Oh, the... Now, is that... Fifth, di- uh, fifth Dimension, I think, had a hit with that. I can't remember who did it. It's a great. Uh, the soundtrack's <laughs> so. brilliant. Christian Applegate's brilliant. And it, Paul Rudd's brilliant. Everyone's brilliant. It's Steve Carell. But above all, Sir William Ferrell wears his knighthood. That's my recommendation for tonight. Where have you gone for f- Saturday's movie, uh, Van? What have you chosen? Well, for Saturday night, and I'm keeping with the COVID theme on this one. So I have what has to be one of the highest, I think it is one of the highest grossing films of 2022. Uh, notably, this was meant to be released two years previous in 2020. Because of the COVID pandemic, it got shelved. It got shown to the England football team because Tom Cruise was a big fan. And he made them all, made every member of the England squad sign non-disclosure agreements which means that Wayne Rooney sat on his ass for two years <laughs> having to k- keep his mouth shut about Top Gun Maverick, which we all were so desperate to see. And it is Tom Cruise as, you know, Pete Top Gun Maverick Mitchell. Got Sorry, Maverick, not Top Gun. There was no mm-hmm. Top Gun in his name, obviously. Maverick Mitchell coming back to the academy to teach a new generation of recruits how to fly just as he he did to pilot one distinct combat mission and take out an enemy target. It's an absolute banger. It's directed by Joseph Kaczynski, who gave us Tron Legacy. I think he had united with Tom Cruise on Oblivion in 2013. So this is like seven years later. Oblivion is an amazing movie. Top Gun Maverick, equally amazing movie. And this ranks as a really, really great sequel. And you can see this in its UK premiere. On Saturday night on Channel 4, 10 past 9. Do you know, I, I mean, I'm sure you love Top Gun as much as I yeah. I'm sure producer Alex has all the quotes in the... We all have all of our quotes. You can be my wingman any time. It's the most quotable movie of all time. I give you Top Gun Maverick. Here we go. This mission is going to take you and your aircraft to the breaking point. Your skull crushing your spine. Your lungs imploding. Fighting just to keep from blacking out. Here we go. No turning back now. 
Great film, great marriage film, great special effects. I wonder if it'll play as well. I mean, most of us have got big tellies these days, but even so, when you see it in a decent cinema with that amazing sound, it's a different experience, I think. But even so, it's a great recommendation. Now, not the same thing can be said, I'm afraid to say, about my second recommendation for tomorrow, which is, I give you Batman. You might say, Paul, the Batman's a great film. No, not the Batman. Batman from 1966. <laughs> Adam West. Okay, Burt Wald as uh, Dick Grayson. Well, who's Robin, of course. And you have got a, co- a, a couple of Hollywood A-listers are in this. You've certainly got Burgess mm. Meredith, who was in the Mice and Men back in the day and then became Rocky's trainer. You've got uh, Cesar Romero, huge star in the 40s and 50s as the Joker. Couldn't be bothered to shave off his moustache so he paints over it. And you've also got that great and underrated performer, Frank Gorshin, great impressionist as the Riddler. Oh, now, yeah. you haven't got um, Julie Newmar as Catwoman or Eartha Kitt because it's Lee Merriweather. The film made a bit of money, but nowhere near as much as the TV series, but it was bookended between series one and series two of Batman, which made a global superstar of Adam West reinvented The Dark Knight as this kind oh, of comedy yeah. cut up very camp and the film's very camp as well it's got the same kind of on screen visuals you know kap- kapow and stuff when people get punched it's well worth a look and let's face it okay you've got Saturday afternoon it's 3.35pm okay mm-hmm. it's not a, it's an international break weekend do yourself a favour recall Batman from 1966 and you say to the kids this is the rubbish I had to pull up when I was growing up but it's got a certain camp no. certain glossy 35 mil camp charm and the ending is actually borderline for a, for a film it's borderline profound I don't know if you remember when key members of the United Nations are kidnapped and all the liquid is taken out of their bodies and they're turned into powder but then all the powders get mixed up at the end. So you've got all the delegates from the United Nations spoilers speaking the other countries' languages. And Batman says, maybe this is the way forward for universal peace or worse to that effect. So that's my camp recommendation for tomorrow, 3.35 tomorrow afternoon on Talking Pictures TV, Batman. da 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 You know it, Batman. Emergency. Batman speaking. Warning all of you to brace yourselves for big news. The biggest. Tell them, Robin. Holy surprises, Batman. It's really exciting. Soon, very soon, Batman and I will be batapulting right out of your TV sets and onto your theater screens. That's right, Robin. Our first full-length motion picture feature in color opens a whole new world of thrills. The big screen gives us more space on land, sea, and in the air to challenge the most bataclysmic collection of super criminals that ever plotted to take over the world. Number one, the Riddler. Question. Who's going to make the feathers fly and knock Batman and Robin out of the sky? Number two, the Joker. Have you heard this one? It'll kill you, Batman. (laughs) Number three, the Penguin. There are two eggs this wily bird is going to scramble. Batman and Robin. I mean, it is of its time, but it's got a certain kind of glitzy Ooh. charm, I think. And it's on Talking Pictures TV. Um, I interviewed Adam West years and years ago. I spent the day with him in Did Hollywood. You? Yeah, really, he's a lovely, he's a lovely, really lovely fella. And very, kind of self, self-effacing, kind of a nice sense of kind of irony about his own career. And Robin, as played by Dick Grayson, wrote a book in which basically he talked about the hundred, was, yeah. hundred, hundreds of women that he managed to, um, he managed to kind of conquer, as he put it in the book. Uh, but also in the, in the series, he was very angry about constantly having to say things like, holy microphone, anything that and I said to him, I said, what was, the, what was the one that finally tipped him over the edge? And he said, he won, in one script turned up, and he had to say, holy Etruscan snood. How the heck did that, was that, wow. ever worked, was that ever worked into a Batman TV show? Anyway, my final recommendation is a, I mean, I love Clint Eastwood as a director. I think he's a very underrated director, even though he's now been, he's in his 90s now. And one of his more recent films is The Mule in which he plays his age, because he's about a thousand years old now, and he Mm. plays somebody whose life life has fallen to bits around him, and he kind of accidentally gets involved with a drug cartel, and accidentally becomes a drug mule, but because he is a very elderly, courteous gentleman, and with an American passport, he's a very successful drugs mule, and of course this coincides with him trying to rebuild his life, trying to get some money together, he's aware of the damage, of course, he's not an idiot, this kind of thing can do, but by the same token, he's trying to re-establish relationships with his family, build the family again, with his daughter in particular. It's a great film. It's got quite a low-key film. It's not the action-packed film you might expect. Certainly not a yeah. tense summer life. But Bradley Cooper's great in it as well. In fact, it all works, as always, with Clint Eastwood films. It's a solid bit of movie-making, and all the better for it. And you can catch The Meal, which is my Sunday recommendation. BBC Two, 10 o'clock, it's The Meal. Haven't got a clip, because it's all a bit low-key, and then the odd gunfire shot and stuff. But we might play a bit of Toby Keith on the way, because Toby Keith did a song for it, Don't Let the Old Man In. And Toby Keith passed away recently, and one of our very good friends also. Uh, left us Russ Hargreaves and he was a huge Toby Keith fan so I might play a, a different Toby Keith song at the end of our little chat but what have you gone for finally then Van? 
I've gone for what I genuinely, I, in the same way that I can argue that Steve Martin's Father of the Bride remake is the greatest remake of all time. I've got for you what I think is a Godfather 2 level sequel benchmark. I think this is one of the greatest sequels ever ever made to a movie. Hang on, no, no, it's hang, 1993s. Hang, 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 hang on, hang on, before you say what it is, so this is better than Godfather 2 and better than Bride of Frankenstein. Possibly. I genuinely, I gen, I can make that argument. I really can. It is, of course, <laughs> that's what, that's what like, no, hang on. That's why I love you, man. When people hear what this one is, you know, I, I don't, you're, you're a fantastic, yeah, articulate person and you're brilliant at presenting arguments. So the film that is made at least the equal of Godfather 2, and it could be argued, or the equal of Brian Frankenstein is... It is, of course, Adam's Family Values from 1990. I'm sorry, there's an entire, there's an entire generation on, on, there's an entire generation on the edge of a cliff agreeing with me, clicking their fingers right now. There's a bunch of people just below 40, I'm gonna say, politely, between, between 40 and maybe above 20, who think that I'm right on this one. Adam's Family Values is one of the greatest sequels ever made. And it's, of course, Barry Sonnenfeld's follow-up to 1991's Adam's Family. You know, the, the adaptation of the 60s Adam's Family, you know, TV show brought to life on cinema screens. This is Christina Ricci. I think she's, at that point, she's about 14 years old. She's playing about 10. But this is, this is the oh, Adam's she, Family. She plays at Wednesday, and Wednesday's child is full of woe, which is why she's called Wednesday. And at the end of the first Adam's Family, from a baby's born, they call Pubert, which isn't a name I've ever stumbled across in real life. Well, his actual name, I think you'll find if you check it out, is Pubert T. Adams. So it was very clever writing. Well, it's a uh, T-stand for testicles. I, 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 I want to imagine Thaddeus, but uh, <laughs> one can one can be discerning. <laughs> Uh, the sequel sees Uncle Fester preyed upon by a black widow type con artist played by Joan Cusack, um, whilst the kids are then shepherded off to summer camp to integrate with quote unquote the normal kids, under which they start to stage their own mutiny, their own uh, Camp Krusty style rebellion. Whilst, you know, Gomez and uh, Gomez, Gomez, Gomez and Morticia seek to free Gomez, uh, uh, freak faster, free faster. I'm losing my mind entirely. Uh, free faster. So many conundrums here. Uh, free faster from his marital woes. I've got a clip for you. This is on E4 on Sunday night at five past seven. I've got a clip for you. And this is Angelica Houston's inimitable performance as Morticia Adams dealing with the so-called Black Widow. I absolutely love this. As I say to you, it's a great sequel. And I give you the best, the funniest moment in the entire, the most quotable moment in the entire movie. Here we go. You have placed Vester under some strange sexual spell. I respect that. But please... May we see him? Don't even think about it. You have gone too far. You have married Fester. You have destroyed his spirit. You have taken him from us. All that I could forgive. But Debbie... What? Pastels? Get out of my house! Hit the road! And if you ever show your faces around here again, I'll have you locked up for trying to visit. Pastel colours, I think she means, does she not? Yeah. Because he, you know, he, yeah, he, he, she should, he should be black and gothic. And not, I mean, it is, it is a funny, good film, this one, I have to say. And they, and again, it's a, a bit like, in a different way, the fact that the Batman movie is raised immeasurably mm. by Burgess Meredith and Cesar Romero. The cast of the, I mean, Joan Cusack does give great nutcase, does she not? I think one of the greatest casting decisions in history, I mean, two of the greatest casting decisions in history are... Uh, Raul Julia as Gomez Adams, yeah. and secondly, uh, Angelica Houston as Morticia. Like that is probably the the greatest duo yeah. that anybody has ever cast in the history of fiction. It's also hashtag relationship goals because I don't think anybody in reality has ever had the sexual chemistry that, that they have. It's just it's it sets the screen yeah. alight. It's an all timer. Fantastic stuff there from our mate Van Connor, of course, to catch him in off screen, which I presume this will go big on the Ghostbusters, will it not? Frozen Empire. 
<laughs> it is. And thanks to the premiere being tonight means we have to get up at 6.30 and record it you know, this morning. So, you know, it'll be out for 8 a.m., oh. I promise. Oh. I promise. We, we recorded the rest in advance, but we, 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 we left the last bit, the Ghostbusters bit, for 6.30 this morning. That's because he loves you, folks, and you can download that podcast off screen right after this show, from 8 o'clock, I think it is. As soon as they've done their, as soon as they've got a bed, they've probably just done their pre-record. It's me, Paul Rosso, with Van Connor on Talk Sport and Talk Radio, and we, my friends, are live till 5 of the moment. That's a wrap.